Hello, everyone. My name is Jim DeWald. I'm the Dean of the Hosking School of Business. Thank you so much for joining us for the second installment of the Global Business Futures Initiative Conversation, a virtual webinar series. You know, Professor Rebecca Henderson from Harvard calls this a world on fire. And while we live in this world on fire, um, I want to acknowledge how important it is for me to live in, Cal in Canada, how much I appreciate that. And as part of our Canadian institution, I want to take this opportunity to acknowledge in Calgary, the traditional territories of the Blackfoot and the people of the Treaty 7 region in Southern Alberta. This includes the Sitsika, the Pakani, the Kainai, the Sutina, and the Stony Nakoda First Nations. As well, the city of Calgary is home to the Métis Nations of Alberta, Region 3. This is a critical part of our infrastructure that makes Canada a great place to be, particularly as we live in a world on fire. So please join me in acknowledging the tra traditional territories of Indigenous people in your location, as I know not everybody on this uh, webinar is from Calgary. Now this is, as I said, the third event and the, the uh, Global Business Futures Initiative or GBFI as we call it, is an emerging thought leadership center within our school, the Haskin School of Business. Now GBFI is tasked with launching a regular global business summit that will serve managers, directors, investors, and policymakers on the issues related to achieving corporate longevity and prosperity, the ability to survive past all of the disruptions that we see. Going forward, this will be a very exciting initiative for our school. And today, it's my great pleasure to introduce Adam Legg, the President and CEO of the Business Council of Alberta, as our keynote speaker today. Now, many of you will know Adam, in fact, Adam was the original director of the GBFI and got it off its feet. So we're so glad to have him back at Haskin. And many of you will know Adam through his two decades building and leading high performance teams and organizations in business, public policy and economic development. In fact, he was the 18th president and CEO of the Calgary Chamber where he totally transformed a struggling organization into a national and international award-winning entity. He wrote a book on it, by the way, Making a Remarkable, and it's a fantastic book, and I recommend it to everybody in the audience. Adam since went on to be the founding uh, president and CEO of the Business Council of Alberta, and um, which was formed in 2019, the Business Council of Alberta has a simple but radical idea, making life better. Now, today, Adam will discuss what business leaders in Alberta need to compete and to complete, compete in a new world and through these turbulent times. I want, want to also introduce Alex Ozieski, Associate Professor of Entrepreneurship and Innovation at the Haskin School of Business and Academic Director of the Global Business Futures Initiative. And also we have with us L'Oreal Anderson. L'Oreal is a manager learning and development programs at the Haskin uh, Executive Education Group. She's responsible for designing, developing and delivering and evaluating the professional learning and development programs we offer with our, within our executive education branch. So now it's my pleasure to pass this over to Alex, and I'm sure you're really going to enjoy the next hour. Alex. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, and thank you um, participants for joining us uh, today for this exciting interview, for this exciting discussion. Let me start with a couple of housekeeping items. So the interview will go like that. We prepared a couple of questions for our guest, for Adam, and this will take, uh, answering them will take 15 to 20 minutes. And after that, we are planning to open this discussion for Q&A. Some of the questions uh, come from the audience. They come from you when you registered for the event. And we are really grateful for those questions. 
we will pick those questions from the list. Other questions, uh, you are, I encourage you to ask live questions during the discussion. Uh, we have the Q&A uh, optionality, uh, Q&A functionality uh, in this webinar platform. So Q&A feature is available. You will find the icon Q&A at the bottom of your screen. Uh, it is open to all audience members and you have the ability to uh, put there your question, but also you have the ability to upload questions that you like. So uh, there is no need to, for example, copy the question that you like and uh, or, if you like something, upload it. We will see it at, at the top of our question lists and list, and we will um, ask Adam that question. Uh, so, with that said, let's actually proceed to the discussion. Adam, our first question to you is the following. We all know that 2020 is an extraordinary year. So a lot of good and bad things are happening. And we have major COVID pandemic result in economic recession and all businesses are right now trying to find their place in this new reality. Uh, it all threatens Canadian businesses. However, a lot of analysts and including myself uh, have a feeling that COVID didn't change anything dramatically in business environment. Rather, this pandemic, the pandemics accelerated, put on steroids, the trends that have been uh, going on for some time. Things like changing consumer preferences, moving to online, or disintermediation, or um, sort of um, collapse of global world order. So what do you think about it? Is there something totally new that COVID brings, or actually it simply accelerates what has been going on? If yes, what kind of trends are happening there that we should be aware of? Thanks, Alex, and uh, it's a pleasure to be with you uh, today, and, and good afternoon, everyone. So I think a couple ways I'll, I'll look at the, the question. It's a great question. I'll sort of look at first, what were some of the major trends happening before COVID? Secondly, we'll look at did COVID accelerate any of those? And third is sort of what will stick and what, what is new? So I, mean, I think if you look at what were the major trends before COVID, you know, look back at any sort of uh, McKinsey type report, uh, and you know the themes are relatively consistent. You had things like, as you as you mentioned, technology in in the very broad sense, technology innovation, specifically AI, automation, Internet of Things, five G, fourth industrial revolution. You know, this notion of complete disruption of business models of sectors, etc. Um, <clears throat> secondly, you had globalization layered against an increasing protectionism, nationalist, populist agenda, you know, really playing out very significantly with China and the U.S. Um, third was just the march of, of demographic change, uh, aging in a lot of the developed nations, uh, very young profile in emerging economies. Fourth, you know, the changing nature of work, whether that's the, the gig economy or things on demand, the sharing economy. Uh, fifth, climate change is, is another massive uh, trend that, uh, that people were, were keeping on their radar and doing a lot of things around. Uh, six is rising inequity, and that can be from an economic or uh, income standpoint, that can be from a social standpoint. Um, and then finally, this notion of sort of short-termism, uh, the reduced trust, ESG, all, all the mixture of, of uh, the, the public views of business. So... You know, those are generally the kind of the big themes that you often saw in a lot of these reports. Now, you know, I think against the backdrop of that is that you had some some significant trepidation uh, amongst Canadians in terms of a number of those trends. And so in 2017, Ipsos did a study called the, the Canada Next Study. And just a couple of, of quick points here on this to kind of give you a sense of where people's views are. You know, 73 percent of Canadians felt that we're headed toward an environmental disaster based on the current course. 71% felt that the economy was rigged to advantage the rich and the powerful. 58% felt that uh, advancing technology would lead to mass unemployment. 51% felt technology was changing so rapidly they can't keep up. And 48% and that felt that their personal economic situation would not be any better in the next 10 years. So you've got people worried about environment, you've got people worried about 
inequality, about technology, about just their status in life. And so along comes COVID uh, and creates a whole mass of uh, uh, additional uncertainties and the need to accelerate some things. So let's look at what accelerated as a result of COVID. Well, clearly the work from home, remote work, digitization uh, has, I mean, this platform we're on today is simply because we can't convene in person. So we've accelerated the ability to deliver content, engage with our colleagues, and enable work to be done and productivity through a remote uh, environment and, and platform. Um, we're now being asked to stay at home as much as possible. So the rise of online shopping, uh, which has driven the demand for more gig economy people to do deliveries, et cetera. Um, automation uh, with people needing to be physically distant, uh, with uh, more people being uh, exposed to viruses. Uh, companies are looking at how do they automate their way through uh, a process so that they don't need as many people who are vulnerable to, uh, to virus and pandemics. There's a huge push now for domestication of supply chains and manufacturing. So that sort of reversal of a globalization trend that we uh, we're seeing as a re result of uh, sort of nationalist agendas. Um, people don't want to be reliant on having pharmaceutical manufacturing dominated in China. They want to have domestic production. We're seeing that play out in Canada right now with respect to our own vaccine manufacturing. We're sort of uh, lower down the, the, the ability to fully inoculate our population simply because we don't have that, that domestic supply. Uh, and manufacturing capability. We've seen societal issues grow. Um, in the midst of the pandemic, the Black Lives Matter uh, movement uh, rose in significant prominence uh, as a result of the killing of George Floyd uh, back in June. Um, rising inequality, we've seen that the, 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 the pandemic has exposed um, uh, how so many of the frontline workers, the people who we rely on in terms of those essential services, are in lower wage jobs and some of the vulnerabilities that they have. So it's accelerated. I think that conversation around, around equity in the workplace. And finally, geopolitics. I mean, I think uh, we're seeing in terms of how some certain countries responded to that uh, and have played out that geopolitics is, is a significant thing that's been accelerated. But, you know, I think other things have been unaffected by COVID much to your point. Uh, the demographic changes are marching along as they were pre-pandemic. Uh, technological advancement and disruption are going to continue to be uh, a force. So we've accelerated some elements of it, but it's continuing to be there. Uh, populism, I think, is uh, the, the further inequities and continued inequities are going to continue to drive populist agendas. And finally, climate change um, is, has, has not, it's, it still continues to be a significant uh, focus, despite the fact that, A, we've generally reduced our emissions as a result of the reduced travel. But secondly, it's actually dropped in the sentiment of what Canadians view as top priorities pre-COVID. is one of the top issues are Canadians, according to Nano's research, it had about 20.5% of Canadians felt it was the number one issue. Uh, now it's about 8.3% of Canadians. So it's about the number four issue uh, in, in Canadians' minds. So what are the new trends? What will stick? Uh, fundamentally, I think little uh, of the core understanding um, uh, underlying issues, sorry, have changed. We're still an aging population that's in developed nations, a young population in emerging countries. Our planet is still warming. There's still billions around the world that want a better quality of life and greater equity. Um, there's still bad people around the world trying to do bad things. Technology is still advancing and sectors are being disrupted. Um, and uh, we still rush out to buy the new iPhone, even though it really doesn't change every year. So I personally don't think that the world is in for the major reset that people think uh, or are talking about. I do agree with you that I think it's accelerated some things, but fundamentally we're going to go back to, to somewhat life as normal. Um, I think people are getting tired of the work from home scenario. I know I am, um, you know, and I think we're seeing COVID cases spike in Alberta, for example, because people want to go back to the normal life. They're tired of living the COVID life. And so you know, we'll, uh, we'll see continued acceleration of that technology side. We're going to see continued evolution of new ways of work. Um, we're going to see accelerated uh, pace of nationalization of supply chains. Um, I think ESG investing is going to continue to be a major force. Uh, e has always been the big piece here in Alberta. I think we're going to increasingly see a shift to the S side um, as a result of uh, some of these growing inequities. I think we're going to see a greater role of government in the economy and people's lives. I think people are now seeing that there is a role and a need for government to help stabilize in some of these major crises that happen. And I think we're going to see a shifting role of business and society as the conversation continues around what role does business have in terms of 
profit versus stakeholder uh, approach. And uh, so we're going to continue to see that conversation play out uh, in the near future. Thanks very much, Adam. This is all really interesting. As you've alluded to, this year has seen an unprecedented amount of disruption, um, but we are hopeful we'll see some things return to the state of normal, whatever that looks like in 2021. How do you see the future of business in Alberta and Canada in the post-COVID world? What will be Canada and Alberta's place in the world in this fourth industrial revolution? Well, I think, uh, I think the future for Alberta and Canada uh, post-COVID uh, fourth industrial revolution standpoint is actually very bright. You know, but I but I put a big caveat around that, and is it will take intention, and it will take being purposeful. You know, Alberta has been hit hard, and it has been hit hard since 2015 when oil prices uh, collapsed, and we were just struggling to get our way back. But then COVID came along, um, so we're being hit by a number of of, of crises: a pandemic crisis, the health crisis, uh, the economic crisis. Um, so we've got lots that. But you know, my view is that you know Alberta has. I will never count Alberta out. Uh, particularly, I will never uh, count Canada out. And in fact, for Alberta, I think this is a chance to show uh, the world that we're just getting started. So I'm incredibly bullish uh, on Alberta. And, and you know, what I see is a view of, it, this could be the theme of Canada, but I really sort of apply it in my day-to-day -day work to the, to the province of Alberta, um, is that I think our, the theme of our next chapter is really the place to solve the world's hardest and biggest challenges. You know, we have to um, recognize that the world has a tremendous number of, of, of challenge-driven opportunities. And I wrote about this earlier in 2020, but the need to set challenges out there, let entrepreneurs and innovators go after them. And I think you can do this on both a national and a provincial level, but it's inherently an interesting, un-Canadian to put a grand and bold challenge out there and then seize it. But I think we really need to get over that. My friends, Sean Spear and, and Robert Esselin wrote a, a paper for the Public Policy Forum called the New North Star 2. And it's really about a challenge-driven industrial strategy. And I 100% subscribe to that, that we need a, a challenge-driven industrial strategy for our province, for our country, and rooted in some of those key challenges. So, I mean, look at what's been accomplished by setting the collective challenge of, of, of delivering a COVID vaccine. You know, prior to COVID, the fastest vaccine timelines were measured in sort of four or five years. We're now looking at vaccines being deployed in a matter of eight, 10 months uh, from the largest pandemic since the, the uh, Spanish flu. So it's marrying the global challenges, the domestic strengths and assets and technology and innovation. That's what the fourth industrial revolution is all about, enabling the environment, the policy and the, uh, to, to, to seize those, those, those innovation challenges and then let innovators and entrepreneurs do their thing. And so for what does that mean for Alberta? I think it means building on our strengths, aligning to the challenges of the world and what the world needs. And the world needs energy, the world needs food, the world needs materials, it needs good health, and it needs uh, incredible experiences. So if you match that up against what Alberta has in terms of our sectors, uh, I, I first and foremost look to energy. You know, I, I don't for a minute think that energy is done. I think Alberta's energy sector has a, has a tremendously bright future, uh, whether it's cleaner oil and gas, uh, LNG, hydrogen, Definitely, we need to improve our emissions uh, profile, be better ESG performers on the E side, but I'm a firm believer there's a strong support for that sector. Um, if you look at agriculture and food, whether it's value-added food processing, the primary production uh, of it, the plant proteins, uh, all these sorts of things, tremendous opportunity of feeding a hungry world. Forestry and fiber products uh, continuing. I mean, you couldn't find a two by four to save your life during the pandemic. Everybody was doing the home renovation thing. Um, and uh, so there's a huge amount of opportunity for, for Alberta and Canadian based uh, wood products. Um, the province has announced a, an ambition to have uh, to be a global leader in plastics and uh, and, and recycling. Um, huge opportunity there. Uh, bitumen beyond combustion, the carbon fiber nature of, of, of what that bitumen can provide to be a, a new product in, in many uh, in material science, rare earth minerals for batteries and other sorts of uses. Again, all of these things are things that Alberta can lean into. Um, I look at the, uh, the, the landscape for, for film, television, and tourism. People are going to want to get out of their homes, out of their communities, and travel again. They're going to want to see the beautiful landscape that we have and what's in our backyard here. So I think tremendous opportunity there. So it's just a matter of saying, what are those grand challenges in the world and how do we seize upon them? You know, I think innovation and technology is a really growing sector in, in, uh, in, in Alberta. We've unleashed uh, some real incredible innovators. We've now had our second unicorn uh, which is a company selling over a billion dollars uh, with happened with the sale of Benevity uh, late last week. 
Um, artificial intelligence. Edmonton is one of the top three global uh, hubs for artificial intelligence based on the research capacity at U of A. Sorry to plug out of the university, but you know, it's still, it's a global leader. And how do we then take that and adapt it to our, our key sectors like transportation? I know companies like WestJet, Suncor, Nutrient, examples of Alberta companies leaning into the application of AI. Um, so what does Alberta need to do? Um, you know, I think there is a number of things. First, we need to build on those strengths, define the challenges that we'll take on, marry them up with the strengths of Alberta's economy, its people, its landscape, its resources. Um, so whether that is energy, food, travel, tourism, uh, technology, et cetera. Next is building the policy and regulatory and, and, re and innovation structures to make those happen. Uh, then create the workforce development strategies and tactics that you're going to need to make sure you have the workforce and, and the University of Calgary, the Haskin School leaders and developing the, the, uh, the innovators of the future, uh, the entrepreneurial thinking that will be necessary to solve some of those grand challenges. So the U of C is a key role in, in the future of Alberta, quite frankly. Um, next is Alberta's tax and regulatory competitiveness. Our cost of living, quality of life are all really very strong and competitive. I think Alberta needs to fix its revenue model, get something more stable, more certain, and more reliable. Um, and then finally, this is something more about for what each and every Albertan can do. And I think we've, we've, we have way too much rivalry in our province. Um, you know, whether some of them are fun between the Flames and the Oilers or the, uh, the soon to be renamed Eskimos uh, and the uh, Stamps. But um, I think the also thing that I find is that when we talk about the energy sector, uh, folks in the tech sector say, well, what about me? If we talk about the tech sector, folks in energy say, what about me? We, we, we just don't have the luxury of that kind of competition. There's too many people, too many places that are, 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 are going to seize on that. We have to be about the end. So there's room for everybody. There's room for all of that to happen. So I'd say, let's get over the rivalry. Let's embrace. Let's cheer on other sectors when they're doing well. Um, let's cheer on other um, uh, institutions when they do well. Let's just be about the collaborative Alberta spirit. And I think we can do really well in the future. Thank you, Adam. This is a great long answer to a question about what technologically can, can be the driver of Alberta's development in the future. And I actually fully agree with you. All the innovation scholarship shows that as long as you have a region that has um, human capital, with universities and educated workforce. And as long as you have local capital, the region can reinvent itself and successfully reinvent itself a couple of times. But here that something comes to my mind is um, we really also might need to move from technology to geopolitics. Geopolitics. We know that right now the global trade order is in danger nationalistic sentiments, uh, the ideas that we need to produce locally critical, all the critical things like personal protective equipment or vaccines uh, and um, collapse of global alliances. All of this is basically threatening the global world order and it might look totally different after COVID. How do you think, what can be Alberta's place in this global world order? And what can be Canada's place in the new global world order that will emerge after COVID? Well, the, uh, the, the world, as you mentioned, is, is completely disrupted. Uh, and there's so much going on from a geopolitical standpoint. Much of it was in play before COVID uh, emerged. And I think what the key piece for us um, is to recognize that it's difficult for a, a province level to be doing sort of uh, different types of uh, trade agreements and things like that. But we need to figure out how can we play in the broader context. and so. Trade will be more complex. Geopolitical relationships will be more complex. Um, but I think for Canada and Alberta, the key message is we really can't rely on the trade partners that we always have at, in, to the magnitude that we have in the past. Um, so U.S. and China are becoming increasingly complex. And while China, we do, or sorry, with the U.S., we do need to rekindle that relationship after you know a strained four years uh, under, under the Trump administration. Um, you know, having said that, you know, there, there was great support for the Keystone Excel project and hope that that goes through with the Biden administration. But you know, we've got to we've got to rekindle that relationship. Um, but we have to make sure we don't put as many eggs in the basket of the U.S. trade. It's just it's far too much. It's in the 75 to 80 percent of our trade uh, happens with the U.S. Uh, we've got to balance out that we've got to diversify that. Um, 
and, uh, and, and look to other markets. Again, with China, I think it's a bit of a cautious play there. There's a massive economic market, uh, but from a trade and a human rights and transparency standpoint, uh, it's clear they're, they're not playing by the rules. And so we have to be very cautious of those uh, relationships going forward. Um, and I think we need to look at, at other uh, growing, emerging, uh, expanding economies in, in Africa, in Asian economies like Korea, India, Southeast Asia, uh, look for those opportunities that are really going to position us for growing markets. Because if we can seize on those opportunities we talked about a second ago, solving some of the world's greatest challenges around energy, around food, around materials, uh, around health, those are th sorts of things that anywhere around the world will want to seize on the opportunities. But I think the key piece for Canada, for Alberta to keep top of mind amidst in addition to the diversification of our, of our trade relationships, our geopolitical relationships, is that as we look to develop our domestic supply chain and our manufacturing capacity, every other economy is going to be doing the same. And so this word competitive is going to be top of mind for everybody. So I think Canada and Alberta need to be hyper competitive. Everywhere is going to be with trying to compete to win domestication of supply chain with manufacturing. So we need to be uh, hyper diligent, hyper uh, focused on competitiveness. And I'm in fact quite worried about our ability to be competitive in the place in the world from a Canadian standpoint. Um, given the complexities of what's happened, given the complexity and some of the track record we have in Canada of, of, of to some degree, missing the opportunity, Olex. You know, I look back at, you know, I need to look back at the history of, of smartphones or Corel or Nortel or Wyland, major Canadian companies that just weren't able to get traction globally. There's something that we haven't been able to get to critical mass or, or size. We've got a few winners in that history, you know, um, Shopify, for example, uh, it, 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 you know, Benevity sale locally here. Um, there are some emerging companies, but it's, it's, it's the sort of the exception, not the rule in Canada. Uh, I also look at some of the major projects we've tried to get through, whether it is uh, starting back as far away as the Mackenzie Valley pipeline, but even some of the, the LNG projects in Quebec, Petronas, uh, Energy East, uh, some of the grain and rail terminals and, and port terminals trying to happen in, uh, in Quebec and BC. We just don't have the regulatory uh, structures to be able to compete for capital and investment here in Canada. We need a, a transformation uh, of Canada's regulatory system because we're ranked um, 34th out of 35th of OECD countries in terms of the time required to get uh, approval for new construction projects. Th th these are numbers we have to solve if we're going to compete and be a player geopolitically uh, for investment, for talent and for, for, for business development. So again, diversifying our key markets, being hyper-competitive and build the right relationships going forward. Thanks, that's really interesting. Um, your comments around competitiveness really kind of make us wonder what can our business leaders within Calgary and Alberta and Canada more broadly do to make sure that their companies find their place in this new reality? How can they ensure that they're poised to, to take that next step? Uh, great question, L'Oreal. And I, I think the first and foremost is, is to just sort of acknowledge and accept that so many of these trends are, are happening. They're, they're, they're real. Uh, they're not going away um, and that businesses need to be prepared. And once you sort of come to that, that realization standpoint, there's really three things that I, I talk fairly consistently about, um, and that's adaptation, uh, collaboration and preservation. So I'll, I'll touch on each one of those, you know, in terms of adaptation, nothing is staying the same adaptation of people, business, government, institutions, nonprofits, all will be essential as the world continues to change and evolve and disrupt. Adaptation requires we don't sit around and wait for the solution to be given to us or mandated. We assess the situation, we make the changes, deliver the solutions that are right for the moment. Uh, it'll prove again to be one of those uh, most important traits for humanity to be able to adapt and to evolve. Um, uncertainty and the resultant adaptation creates immense opportunities, but recognizing it, will, it the, 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 the march towards adaptation is a constant. You always need to be assessing, always adapting. Uh, and that's for both firms and for people. Um, you know, the, the notion of, of work integrated learning and micro credentialing will be increasingly important as people continue to upgrade their skills as, as roles change, technologies change, uh, and environments change. Um, upgrading boards of directors to make sure that uh, they have an understanding of these issues in terms of, say, technological and innovation capacity, social issues and movements, etc. Um, I think it will be uh, important to recognize that there are uh, 
immune systems within organizations and corporations that will push back against that adaptation. So for leaders to be prepared and understand where that, that immune system will push back when they try and adapt and when they try and change will enable them to succeed and, and be more successful in their transformation efforts. Um, and then finally, recognizing that uh, you know, the, the disruption will continue. Uh, there is a, a team in a basement or a co-working space right now that is actively working to disrupt your business, your sector. Um, and don't underestimate that. Prepare for it. Put your firm through processes that will enable you to get ahead of that disruptive process. I always encourage business leaders to, to sort of think like training like astronauts and special forces. Uh, they prepare for the worst. They train and prepare relentlessly. How can you put your organization through? COVID has been an incredible uh, reality of what they've had to do there is to really accelerate that training and preparation standpoint. Um, but make sure you're continually doing that. Uh, so you're not, uh, you're not risking disruption. Uh, next is collaboration. Um, the reality is no one can do it alone. There's too much opportunity and too many grand challenges in the world for one company or, or only government or only business to tackle them. Uh, we'll need to make strong collaborations and ones that challenge the status quo and conventional ways of doing things and thinking about building those and solutions I mentioned a minute ago. Um, you know, ones, collaborations that unite uh, and, and build. Examples of that here in Alberta, COSIA, the uh, Canadian Oil Sands Innovation Alliance, or CRIN, the Clean Resource Innovation Network, great examples of the energy sector. Groups like the A100 uh, collaboration of innovators and entrepreneurs uh, forging ahead for the tech sector. Uh, the 51, a newly uh, launched uh, financial uh, feminist capital movement here in Alberta, um, break down the conventional walls uh, that hinder innovation and tackling those grand challenges. Um, and then finally, preservation, you know, and I, I think preservation across a whole host of things, L'Oreal, uh, the vitality and prosperity of our people that enable creation and contribution and caring of the powers and the platforms, networks and movements for good and not evil. Um, preservation of our planet, uh, of those things that make us uniquely human and enable connections and the ability to collaborate. I'll be honest, I'm, I'm quite worried about people coming out of COVID, um, you know, the physical health, their, their emotional and mental health, the financial situation, uh, employment situation. It's a major issue for low income youth and racialized populations. And many of the jobs that are being shed right now just aren't coming back. Uh, we need to take care of people. Uh, we need to ensure they have the opportunity and pathways to prosper and the because I think the alternative breeds uh, resentment and populism and uh, risks of, of, of civil unrest. Um, and then finally is this notion of the preservation. You have this tension between the short-termism and the long-termism that I mentioned earlier. And evidence shows that firms that focus on the short-term you know, quarterly uh, perform worse than those that focus on a long-term approach. But how do you do that when the world is changing so quickly? How do you do that when you get something like a pandemic? Um, and we need to ensure that firms are capable of lasting and that they have the structures, frameworks, compensation models that incent them to focus on the long term, but being able to be nimble. And I think that's going to be the, the key characteristic of, of firms that are successful in the future, are the ones that are able to think and plan and, and, and have a long term perspective, but still be nimble enough and responsive enough to tackle the challenges that lay right at their feet every single day. So, Excellent. Thank you. So basically what we did over this half an hour, we went from discussing the global perspective more towards what a business leader can do right now in order to, to thrive, in order to find their place in the new reality. Right now it is time to open up for audience questions. And um, as, as I said before, we have quite a few questions that um, the participants uh, asked when registering. Thank you very much for that. And we also are already are getting live questions through Q&A function of the webinar platform. So at this stage, let's start uh, working with this, some of these questions. Please, please, please feel free to ask questions and particularly to upload questions that you really like. Um, this will allow us to select the, most, the questions that are most interesting and challenging for Adam. Now, if it is possible, I will start with asking a question that came uh, from registration from Richard. And it is very logical that it comes, um, we, you have just discussed from a general level what business leaders can do in order to thrive in the new environment. Now let's get to very particular question. So question from Richard, what are the realistic prospects and timelines for the live entertainment, dining, tourism, and airline business? 
both in terms of survival, government assistance, and employment based on what we know about the duration impacts of COVID? Yeah, great, great question. This is this is one that um, I, I agree with uh, Frances Donald. She's the chief economist for Manulife, and and we talk a lot about the sort of the the, the differing letters of recovery and you know the the notion of a K shaped recovery or what have you. The issue around uh, those sectors which are very interpersonal, very high touch, very very face to face experiences is it, it's ultimately an issue of, of social trust. Um, you know, until there is some degree of, of, of widespread vaccination, uh, or unless there is some means of being able to, to determine whether the person, the stranger you're interacting with, um, or even a friend for that matter, um, uh, has or does not have COVID, I think we're stuck with uh, some fairly low utilization of everything from travel, uh, tourism, fitness, hospitality, restaurants, etc. Every time you go out, while we're taking all the proper protocols, masks, and washing our hands, and and physical distancing, et cetera, um, you just have no way of knowing whether the person who is six feet away from you has COVID or not, um, if they're asymptomatic. So the issue is social trust and, and the things that will bring back social trust are vaccinations, um, are, are low numbers of, of COVID cases on a daily basis, uh, or some sort of visible recognition that you are clean free of, of, of COVID, which is some sort of rapid testing and some sort of kind of like immunity passport type of scenario. Um, my guess is we probably won't go down that ladder pathway. Um, it'll likely be something around uh, where we get, uh, we bend the curve and we have lower cases in addition to the vac The vaccine will be the ultimate barometer and, and, and license for social trust, but I don't really see that happening. Uh, it, you know, sounds like it'll be well into sort of summer and early fall of next year before that's a reality. Um, only when that happens will we really see the return to those highly personal interactive uh, uh, activities uh, like tourism and travel and, and, and eating restaurants and fitness. So does gov government support and, and, and employment? I think we'll, the government support will obviously clearly have to be uh, stronger for those sectors. Um, in terms of employment, uh, they'll likely be muted for quite some time until that social trust is, is, is regained. So uh, those will likely be the sectors that um, are the slowest to return and recover um, uh, uh, from, from the pandemic and its economic fallout. Thanks very much. You've spoken about the role of government in, in the recovery of our you know, provincial and national economy. Um, and particularly within the oil and gas sector, um, how do you reconcile the Alberta resource-based economy with what seems to be the federal agenda in this space? And is there really an opportunity for Alberta in terms of selling our gas and oil? Um, you know, what, what prospects do you see for this industry moving forward? Yeah, there's, there's no doubt that uh, there seems to be some conflict between uh, a resource-based economy and some of the, the, the federal policy and legislation that's coming forward. You know, what I would say is that uh, Alberta and the resource sector are working very hard to to be in line with with whether it's a, a strong ESG performance or the net zero uh, ambitions, the Paris ambitions that the uh, that, that the country has set. And you know they're they're not irreconcilable. Uh, the reality is you're seeing a number of of oil and gas companies committing to net zero. Um, uh, like everyone, they're working on the pathways and the processes and the technologies to get there. Um, you're seeing uh, them working very hard on emissions reduction, uh, both in the oil and gas sector, the agriculture sector, um, but uh, they definitely are, are working very hard on, on fixing and addressing the E side of the ESG. Um, and I think uh, to, you know, we've seen the federal government responsive to uh, some of the needs of the industry with respect to support for uh, Trans Mountain, uh, the approval of the NGTL uh, expansion uh, project in, in, uh, in, for the Nova Gas. Um, and uh, you're continuing to see them advocating for KXL. So they, they, are, they are driving that agenda. I think what's gonna be important is how can we ensure that the resource sector and government work very collaboratively to driving the shared uh, efforts towards uh, a, a low carbon future. And so the sector uh, and the government can work very closely on things like carbon capture sequestration, uh, on reducing emission technologies. Um, and the reality is even if we, if we are looking at say a hydrogen future, Canada's uh, greatest opportunity there is in uh, blue hydrogen, which is a natural gas uh, origin of hydrogen with a carbon capture storage component. 
So the development of our resources needs to continue on even in a very low emission, zero emission environment. So it'll be imperative that government and business and encourage, and we've been encouraging government to work very closely with the industry to ensure that we've got the right policies, the right processes, the right innovative capacities, the right ability to attract capital, to make those investments that will enable emissions reduction, that enable us as a sector and as an economy to meet those uh, ambitions. And then after that, quite frankly, uh, it's up to us individual Canadians. Uh, the majority of, of greenhouse gas emissions come from the consumption end of the equation. And so as we begin to make better choices uh, around what we do in terms of our of our power, of our, uh, of our, of our transportation. I mean, uh, for example, Alberta is going to be ahead of the, the curve in terms of its ambitions to reduce its reliance on coal. It'll be phasing out coal completely, essentially, uh, by 2023, uh, which is eight years ahead of schedule. So our, our power companies are doing their part uh, to, uh, to reduce the emissions profile. Then we've got to get on board as, as individuals to, uh, to drive down our, our energy and, and uh, consumption until there are, you know, viable economic and, and cost uh, effective solutions on, on a zero or no emission basis. Okay. Uh, probably I would like to get right now to one, one more question from the um, participants when registering. And this question really fits well into what you have just discussed. So please feel free to, feel free to answer those parts of the questions that are still left unanswered. But I really would like to highlight that this was one of the questions from the audience. So question from Douglas. Seemingly the most effective and efficient transition from fossil fuel energy to renewable sources would be to utilize the expertise and profits of a successful oil and gas industry to research and implement change. How do you think the small but growing Alberta technology sector will influence the evolution of Canada energy sector, and will Alberta be able to build out its technology markets to become a global competitor? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. I would actually say it's, it's already happening. You know, there's very much uh, a, a strong uh, network and collaboration between uh, our resource sectors and, um, and the technology innovation sector. Um, whether you look at uh, what I mentioned earlier, the Clean Resource Innovation Network, uh, or known as CRIN, uh, a, a, a consortium of uh, academia. I know University of Calgary is, is a member of CRIN, um, a consortium of academia, business, government, all working together to, to find the technologies and the applications for not only emissions reductions, but our future energies and future opportunities. Um, so that's an example of, of how groups like University of Calgary or uh, Platform Calgary or, or uh, innovation groups are, are working together um, to, to, to try and find linkages with business with some of those grand challenges and, 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 uh, and opportunities I mentioned about earlier. Uh, COSIA, another organization I mentioned earlier, the uh, Canadian Oil Sands Innovation Alliance, where you got a number of Canada's oil sands companies coming together uh, and sharing ideas around uh, intellectual property, patents, et cetera. Um, so they're collaborating and reaching out to uh, the, the, the innovative innovation community and saying, how do we uh, solve some of these challenges about reducing emissions and emissions intensity with the oil sands projects? Um, Evoke uh, is a interesting uh, solution that uh, both Suncor and Sonovas pooled uh, a large pots of money to create a $200 million fund that then invests in uh, emerging and renewable technologies uh, for for energy, um, and they've made a number of investments that are are, are very fruitful and are, are driving innovation in uh, everything from renewable uh, energies to reducing emissions of of existing sectors. Um, and one of the the investments uh, I believe they've made is is a company uh, in Alberta called Virum, uh, which has uh, been been a tremendous success in supporting the. Uh, the oil sands and the oil and gas sector from an innovation standpoint. So I think there's lots, there's lots happening. It's going to accelerate as many of these companies think about how do they put those challenges out to the innovation sector and get some, uh, whether it's a hackathon or a sprint, but creating some kind of more demand or poll driven uh, innovation ecosystem will be important about marrying up the technologies and, and creations of our innovative Albertans and Canadians with the challenges that are needed by the oil and gas sector. So I see a, great amount of activity already happening. And I think it's just gonna get bigger bigger and better from here. I certainly hope so. 
Um, so this question comes from Jan. Um, it's one of our live audience questions. With the many thousands of layoffs, I worry that Alberta is losing its best and brightest. We've historically attracted major talent to the energy industry, which has been vibrant, exciting, and lucrative. And which businesses or industries will top professionals and technicians want to work in Alberta going forward? Well, I, I think uh, similar to the to the response uh, a few questions ago is you know I'm very very bullish on Alberta. Um, I I think we're 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 down, but we're not out, um, and I think uh, this is the place to solve the greatest challenges. So I think. Really, I would look at it from a challenge-driven standpoint. If, if, if we look at the way that Alberta can solve some of the food challenges, the energy challenges, the, the materials challenges uh, of the world, that's where I would be, be placing my bets. You know, I think um, adding in the layer of technology and innovation, technology and innovation um, is, is less and less a, a vertical sector in and of itself, but is almost sort of the future of every sector cross-cutting everything. So I think there's a huge role for not only uh, people very technologically uh, sophisticated, whether that's in you know, your computer science or an engineering uh, computer um, data scientist, et cetera, those are gonna be very, very important as we get more AI and, and artificial intelligence, machine learning embedded. But it's important to remember that we also need sort of those translators, those interpreters of um, the way in which the business operates and the business challenges to then take over to the computer science and, 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 and data science side of the equation. Um, those are, you know, when I, I had a really interesting conversation with uh, Google's DeepMind up in Edmonton uh, just before COVID. And, and that is really one of those key gaps that they just can't find the people that sort of have that blend of, and that they, they know enough to be dangerous on both sides of, of the business operations and the technological solution to be able to create those opportunities for technology to drive that. Um, so I, I would look at very much a very, uh, I think the resource sector is very strong, agricultural, oil and gas, forestry, but embedding a layer of responsibility to, to ESG uh, and, uh, and sustainability, uh, also applying the technology side. Alberta is a strategic location for transportation, logistics, so adding in, in that is another potential opportunity. Um, one day we'll get our, our tourism sector back up and running, but really I would just view it through the lens of challenge and, and, and what, what great challenge do you want to solve in the world and, and align your, your skill set and your opportunities towards that. Excellent. So since we started talking about human capital, about education, about workforce, I would like to ask a question that comes from Kevin, one of our MBA students uh, from pre-registration. So the question is like that. Do you think the flexibility of working from home or anywhere will stay for the future recruitment? If so, how should we get prepared for the even more competitive global job market as employers and as employees? Uh, well, thanks for the question. I, you know, I would, I would, I would say that I, I personally don't think that the work from home um, will stick as much as people are thinking it, it will stick. I think it, it was, I, it will for certain uh, roles and for certain um, individuals at different parts of their, of their life. Uh, but I don't think it will stick uh, overall. Um, I think people are, are growing tired of it. I think it's, it's taking a massive toll uh, on our mental health. Um, and, uh, and our physical health, um, our ability to, we're social creatures and our ability to interact with each other. You know, we all get uh, tired of seeing each other on sort of little tiny uh, screens uh, such as we're, we're seeing today. Uh, you know, the, you get the Zoom fatigue. Um, and in fact, there's research now coming out. Uh, Collier's, uh, the real estate uh, firm, uh, has, is doing some research showing that uh, as, as, as this progresses, the productivity of workforces is diminishing. Um, and that the, that the mental health and, and interest in continuing to work from home is diminishing. So early on, it was a bit of a, uh, a nice to have, be, or it was essentially, but it was essential to have, but what people were able to have a little bit of uh, a different kind of, of, of respite from the work in, in the office. But I think over time, that's really eroded as we've, we've begun to miss our colleagues. We've been able, haven't been able to collaborate as well as we could in person. Um, we haven't been able to, to, to brainstorm as well. So I just, I don't think it's going to stick. I think it might stick for, for, for folks who um, have challenging schedules or have younger children at home. 
Um, those kinds of things uh, will, will, will definitely be available. I think some technology companies, you've heard uh, rumors of, of companies like Shopify, et cetera, uh, Facebook say they're, you know, they're, 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 they're never going to come back to the office. You know, I, I personally don't buy it 100%. We'll see whether it plays out. But for the foreseeable future, yeah, they're going to do a work from home uh, sort of future. So that's creating opportunities for smaller communities to, as long as you've got decent bandwidth and broadband, um, you're seeing booms in, in uh, I've heard of, of uh, you know, places like Canmore and, and other parts of uh, smaller communities uh, and, and driving real estate prices up because people are trying to find that balance of the quality of life and still be able to work remotely. Um, in terms of how do you get prepared? I think, you know, skills are skills, but to the extent that, you know, if you want to develop software and platforms and technology solutions to meet that market, I think there's a huge opportunity there. Um, but as employers, I, th I think, um, you know, once we get through the vaccine and everybody is, is capable of returning to work, uh, I, I am sure you're going to see more and more employers wanting to do so. Um, and as employees, I think it'll be uh, just being nimble and responsive and understand how you can do your job both remotely and in person um, and how to, 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 as leaders, how do you maintain and foster strong culture um, despite being in a remote work environment like, like a Zoom or Teams? Um, that, that's one of the key challenges. How do you, how do you continue that, that cultural development uh, when you're doing everything remotely? Thanks very much. We do have a number of students on the call today. Um, this question comes from one of them, Adam, um, who asks what advice you would give to students graduating from business who want to stay in Calgary or Alberta. If you were graduating today, what would you focus on to be successful within this new landscape? Um, I, I, in many ways, I'd return to the, the, uh, one of the previous answers, which is, is uh, focus on the, the challenge you want to be part of solving in the world uh, and uh, build your skills and build your capabilities around that. Um, you know, I, I, again, I, I still think there's a robust future for um, our resource sector, our tech sector, our, our transportation sector, uh, our tourism sector here in Alberta. Um, but I would again f try and try and figure out how do you want to tackle. Um, I, you know, I mentioned that Evoke um, uh, Innovations, which is that that fund that uh, Sonovus and Suncor put together. I spoke with the CEO Marty Reed a while ago, and it was really interesting how he contrasts the sort of work ethic and, and sort of mentality of Canadian graduates versus ones that he sees in, in Silicon Valley. The Silicon Valley graduates come out of university and say, okay, I'm going to try and build a company. And if I fail, then I'll go get a normal job. Um, in, 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 in Canada, he said that it's the opposite where everybody goes and tries to get a normal job. Um, and they, they sort of miss out on that entrepreneurial opportunity. And so you get less company formation and less entrepreneurial activity. So, you know, try and think of a challenge. If there's a company that is, is driving the challenge that you want to help be part of solving, uh, go seek that company out. If uh, there isn't any company that's trying to solve a challenge, see if you can bring a group of people together and form a team to try and solve that challenge. So uh, don't, don't discount the notion that uh, Alberta is really growing in its innovation and technology sector. And if you've got something that you can try and put forward some ideas uh, around solving some of those grand challenges through your own entrepreneurial innovation activities is a real opportunity there. Um, initiatives like the Creative Destruction Lab, uh, Rockies run out of the Haskain School is a tremendous example of what happens when you bring uh, inspiring and innovative ideas and entrepreneurs together with seasoned uh, entrepreneurs who then put you through that sprint of really refining your opportunity. So I'd encourage you to look into that, Creative Destruction Lab, Rockies, or the, uh, the Hunter Center and Hunter Hub for Entrepreneurial uh, thinking again, uh, Dean Jim DeWald is, is, is leading in getting the Haskane School graduates to think about entrepreneurialism um, and think about entrepreneurship. And I'd really encourage you to think about how do you take that either to an employer or forge your own employment path as an innovator and entrepreneur. Excellent. So since you, we started discussing the universities and the role of possible possible role universities can play in adjusting to this new reality. Um, I really would like to ask the question that right now is most upvoted in our Q&A uh, section uh, coming from uh, Kevin Coyle. So, hi Adam, what would you recommend that post-secondary institutions do to lean into these changes in our communities and the business environment to keep up? What role should we play? 
So essentially, quest, and I will add from myself, what should universities do? What is our moral imperative to do in this new reality? Uh, great question, Kevin. Um, you know, I, I, th I think universities, particularly universities like University of Calgary, very deep research-based uh, post-secondaries, I think always have to, to be those places of, of inspired uh, and, and deep, thoughtful research and, and empirical study. Um, and so ex exploration uh, is a key, key component of that. But I'd also say that, you know, where I think the United States has Canada beat in many ways is some of those relationships that they form uh, between business and, and academia to solve some of those grand challenges. And, um, you know, I look at the example of, of uh, everybody uses this one. So it's a bit overplayed, but DARPA, the, the, uh, the, advanced uh, research uh, facility and initiative um, in, in Silicon Valley, what is now Silicon Valley today, that really brought together government funding, um, business and academic research to solve some really grand challenges. And that's why we have the Silicon Valley of today. That's why we have so many of the technologies that are, you know, in our, in our smartphones. Um, that was all based out of, out of sort of grand challenge driven uh, tri-party uh, collaboration between post-secondary uh, government and business. So I'd really encourage uh, post-secondaries like University of Calgary to think about how can we create those linkages with, with, with government and with business to solve the grand challenges. Um, I think uh, examples like Creative Destruction Lab are, are, are fantastic that, they're, that, that that's beginning to happen. Um, I think the, uh, the, 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 the reality is that... Um, you know, these, these are often shied away from because it seems to is viewed as being a little too close to business or, 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 or restricting independence of academics. Um, you know, I think there's room for both. I think I would encourage that the, the thinking that we, that academics can have some research freedom, but also then working towards solving challenges. And, and one of the greatest opportunities to build a university capacity is to actually be part of some of those solutions that are going to be driving innovation in the future. And really that speaks to that demand or that pull driven innovation I spoke about earlier so that we're actually solving um, the needs of, of, of people and, and, and our environment and et cetera through that collaboration as opposed to research that doesn't necessarily have any end state. So let's find ways to create that marriage between demand and pull and the capability amongst that tri-party uh, tri uh, solution. Excellent. Thank you very much. So, Adam, it was a great discussion, very informative. Thank you for your insights. And of course, I would like to thank our audience for finding time to join us today for interesting questions. Um, as usual, we couldn't answer all the questions, but we will uh, uh, send the list of the remaining questions to Adam and um, he, might, he might be able to actually address them later on. So I would like to remind everyone that this is the joint webinar by Executive Education of Haskane School of Business and Global Business Futures Initiative. Uh, we are together creating a safe place to learn about future of your business. We are uh, trying to understand what business leaders have to do now in order to achieve corporate longevity and prosperity. Uh, this is the third webinar in a series of webinars and uh, next webinar is scheduled for January when we are going to talk to Michael Rayner, a thought leader at Deloitte, uh, who is really global thought leader uh, discussing issues like um, disruptive innovation and corporate strategy to adjust to this new reality. Recording of the current webinar will be available in about a week. It will take us some time in order to finish the production. And then everyone who registered for this webinar will receive a link that we encourage you to share, to use, and so on. Also, if you would like to hear more from us, that email with the final um, recording will have a form where, that you can fill in in order to get to our mailing list uh, to, get, to hear about the next events. So thank you very much for all of this. And this ends our event. Thank you, Adam. Thank you, L'Oreal.